Hi, I'm Jeff Troll, and today I'm going to talk to you about improving C++ compiler diagnostics using overlays and other features from Emacs. First, an overview of my talk. I'm going to cover what overlays are and how you can use them in code. Then I'm going to talk about C++ and why its compiler errors can be so onerous. Finally, we'll take that information and build a new minor mode using overlays and other Emacs features. First of all, overlays. What are they? They are objects consisting of a buffer range and a set of properties. That means that they cover a region in a buffer. The properties can be a certain set of special uh, property names, in which case they can be used to cause special effects in the buffer, but they never change the underlying text. You can use them uh, for things like hiding things. So, for example, overlays are working right now in this window. WordPresent, the technology I'm using for this presentation, is hiding the asterisk before every headline, as well as the things called emphasis markers, that is, those things that make things look, you know, monospaced for verbatim or italic or bold. Uh, the special characters we use to, to mark off those sections are also hidden by WordPresent using overlays. But those things are still in the buffer and they're still visible to code. So if I run this little snippet of code down here, it's going to go up to the headline overlays and what they can do, and it's going to tell us what's there in the buffer. So let's go down and run this. So according to this code, the contents of the buffer to the left of the headline is a star and a space, which means that even though we can't see that star, it's still there because it's hidden by an overlay. And that's kind of the essence of what overlays are. Let's do a simple overlay example. We have some text on the right here, which is a famous poem by William Carlos Williams, which has been the subject of many memes. Let's create an overlay that covers it. I'll go down here and use this snippet of code here. We'll go up to the top and we'll mark everything between begin verse and end verse. You can see we've created an overlay from positions 74 to 224. Now we can take that overlay that we already created and add a property, in this case a face property, to change the appearance of the text. This is a poem, and it's currently using a face that is monospaced, and so it looks like a computer program, even though it's a poem. So I think it would be nicer to use something with variable width font, maybe with some serifs. So let's give that a try. Now you can see that the poem looks quite a bit different. It looks more like what we'd see in a book. We can also delete overlays. So we already, I've named this one, so we can just go down and run delete overlay and get rid of it, and it'll go back to the appearance it had before. And there it is, it's back to normal. Now, if you're interested in changing all of the verses inside an org mode file, to, some, to a different face or a different font family. This isn't the way you'd really do it. So I'll just show you that real quick. The right way is probably to use, uh, is probably to change the org verse face, which is the face used for all of the verse, in, uh, all of the verse blocks inside your org mode file. And so this is kind of how you do it here. Face remap add relative. Let's give it a try. It worked. There are more advanced things that you can do other than just changing fonts. There's a whole long list of them in the manual, but let's talk about the ones we're going to use today. You can make text invisible, um, just like orgpresent did. The simplest way is to set the invisible property to true. So here's a code snippet that will do that. What we're going to do is go and find the word plums inside the poem. And then we're going to make it invisible by creating an overlay that covers it and then setting the invisible property to true. Boom, it's gone. We have eaten the plums. Visibility is a huge topic and very complicated. There are powerful mechanisms for using it. I suggest reading the manual if you'd like to know more about that. Another thing we can do with properties is to add text either before or after an overlay. Since we've made the word plums invisible, or, or anything that you make invisible in the buffer. If you add text then afterwards, 
it looks like you've replaced the original words with new words. So let's add a property, a before string property, to the overlay that we used before to make it seem as though we're eating cherries instead of plums. Boom, there it is. So um, that's how you can replace words using overlays. You can also have custom properties that you name and then use yourself. For example, you can use it to mark regions in the buffer. You can also use it to add information to regions in the buffer for your own tracking in a minor mode or something like that, which we will use. Finally, two notes on properties. We've been talking about overlay properties, but there's also something called text properties. Text properties are attached to text in a buffer. When you copy that text, the properties come along with it. If you modify the properties, the buffer is considered modified. Org mode makes heavy use of text properties, as we can see by running this little code snippet here, which is going to tell us the properties and the string attached to the sum poetry headline on the right. There's also some controversy regarding performance. It may be that text properties perform better than overlay properties, so do some research if you're going to make heavy use of them. I prefer overlays because they're just easier to use. C++ compiler output. So my day job is C++ programmer, and uh, although I've been an Emacser for many years, and um, it, it, it can be a little bit of a chore uh, dealing with errors. And um, the error messages that come out of the compiler can be pretty hard to understand. And this has often been a barrier, particularly for people who are new to C++. So let's see what that's like. I have an example which is generously supplied by Ben Dean of Intel. Um, so let's see what it looks like when you when you compile a C++ program that has a difficult error in it. Okay. So you see we have a lot of fairly verbose messages. The most verbose one I think is probably here. This one here. These are pretty bad. I think there might be bigger ones. Oh yeah, here we go. Here's my favorite one. You can see let's look for a specialization. This basically, this whole section of the buffer here, that is specifying the specific types that a function template was instantiated with. And that's a lot there. So um, if you're trying to figure out what's wrong with your program and you're looking at something like this, it can be really, really hard to understand. Okay, back to our presentation. So it's often this way in C++ because we compose types from other types, so they can be long to begin with, but then a couple of other factors come into play. First of all, we can have default template arguments. These are arguments you didn't write, but that are implicitly there and can sometimes refer to the arguments that you did write, which causes them to get a bit bigger, such as these allocator arguments here and here. Then there are type aliases. For example, std string here expands to a type with three template arguments. So you can imagine when we combine those two things together, our simple vector of maps from strings to ends becomes this humongous thing here, which, and let's run the comparison. Yeah. So in summary, to properly understand an error when you're a C++ programmer requires knowing the exact types that were supplied to your function. And types are built recursively, and therefore the types can just, like the correct exact name for the type can just be just really huge um, and, and have many levels and layers to it. So uh, when I was trying to understand the things I'd done wrong, especially when I was a newer C++ programmer, but honestly still, like even recently, um, if I was having a really intractable problem, I would just copy the entire error message out, stick it in the scratch buffer, 
and then kind of manually reformat it so I could see what it was telling me I'd actually called the function or whatever it was with the exact type. I had to just kind of like sit there and go through the whole thing. But there's a better way. Now, anyway. So what can Emacs do to help us with this problem? So first of all, if you think about a type name, it's, it's a lot like what we call S expressions or balanced expressions. Lisp code itself is an S expression. Um, it's basically things with parentheses and little atoms or symbols uh, in it or strings or numbers. But um, parenthesized balanced expressions are things that, that Emacs was, was actually built to deal with. There were, uh, I found a, an old manual from 1981, and the two major modes that they recommended or that they, that they, they actually documented in the manual were one, assembly language, and two, Lisp. They mentioned that there were other modes, but they didn't say anything about them. So Lisp is like something with a really long history with Emacs. And, and balanced expressions and like manipulating them and doing them efficiently is just a thing that Emacs knows how to do. And Emacs is good at it. And there's just a legacy of algorithms and, and functions for doing it. So if we take types and we take the angle brackets in the types and, um, and we, and we get the, the symbols right, then we can treat them as though they were balanced expressions or S expressions, the same kind that Emacs is really good at handling. Secondly, we can use overlays to improve the readability of errors. We can take long lines and break and indent them using before string. So the same thing I used to add cherries into the poem. We can use that to insert new lines followed by indentation and produce like a much nicer looking uh, listing of a type. We can also use the invisible property to hide unwanted detail. Last of all, we can create a minor mode. When we're compiling things in Emacs, we often use compilation mode. Compilation mode allows you to install compilation filters that run when the compiler is producing output. And at that time, then we can add our overlays. We can also add in a minor mode commands that do whatever we want to the key map. And in this case, we're going to show and hide lower level details interactively so that we can see a simplified version or a more detailed version of a type depending on our needs. First of all, parsing types is balanced expressions. We need to be able to quickly locate the boundaries and the contents of parenthesized expressions, or in this case, expressions in angle brackets. We use a syntax table inside Emacs to allow movement functions like forward list to jump between matching angle brackets. By default, they're just parentheses. So first of all, let's, let's look at our syntax table. We're going to add here syntax entries to handle angle brackets as though they were parentheses. Then, you know, we have a lot of, we have a lot of types that, that have colons in them. Those are namespaces in C++. By default, Emacs does not recognize them as parts of symbols. So we're going to tell Emacs that a colon is something called a symbol constituent. That it is, it can be part of a name. So once we do that, then we can use our functions like forward list, backward word, all of the navigation and movement functions uh, that we have that do things, that, that do more complicated things like S expressions and so on, can be used now with our angle brackets and, our, and inside of our types. The next thing we can do is perform indent and fill with overlays. We're going to use before string properties to break lines and create indentation to make the output look a little better. Today we fill mostly text and we indent mostly code. We fill text in order to prevent it from running off the side of the right margin, and we indent code to line up syntactic elements. Back in the day, they had algorithms that could do both. And those are what we're going to leverage. We can use the before string property to insert a new line in the correct number of spaces to emulate indentation. As a simplified example, 
Here's some code that will indent 4 upon each open angle bracket. Let's give it a try. The next thing we're going to need to do is hide details. So we have nested types, and the user is going to want to be able to reveal lower level or hide lower level uh, parts of the nested type interactively once we've already reformatted the, um, the error messages. So let's see how we can do that using invisible properties. The first thing we're going to do is mark depths within the type. When we're, when we're originally analyzing and formatting and doing the indentation of the line breaks, at the same time, we're going to go through and mark the nested levels inside the type names, just as this diagram shows. So depth one, for example, will be everything inside the first level of angle brackets. Depth two will be everything inside the second level and so on. And then later on, when the users request it, we can go and look at the depth that they've selected and then mark those sections invisible. Let's see how that might work. First of all, let's delete the overlays that we already have that created the indentation. And now we're going to go and do that marking with the custom depth properties here. To prove that I didn't pull a fast one, let's go and see what describe care tells us about the depths inside here. Let's start here. Okay, so inside this part here, stood straight. There are two overlays. One of them is of depth one and the other is of depth two, which makes sense because depth one is going to be from about here to here, and depth two is going to be from about here, it's going to be this area. So it's reasonable that there should be two, and that's what we expect. Now that we've marked the nested types with their depths, let's experiment with hiding details. This fragment of code takes a user supplied depth, in this case two, and will hide based on those markings that we've already made on the overlays, the custom depth properties. We'll take those and apply your requested level of detail. So let's try it out. Depth two. All right, that hid everything under the stood map, so the deepest level. If we make it one, we should get a level higher than that. So now level one and below are hidden. Now if we put it back to three, it should reveal everything. So that's what we're going to use in our minor mode. Let's have a demo. We're going to revisit the initial example with the minor mode installed. Now we're going to have a compilation filter that will run on every chunk of output produced by the compiler. It's going to add those overlays with the line breaks and the indentation. And it's also going to add overlays that mark up the nested types with the depths for each region. Let's add the hook for tSpew mode. And now we can compile again. All right, we can already see that these things are formatted a little bit better than they were before. They're not all on one line. These are getting kind of lined up here. This is a good example. And here's our big ugly one from before with all the characters in it. Let's try hiding some of this information. We'll just slowly decrease the level of detail and you can see kind of how it works. Over here where there's these ellipses next to string constant, the dot 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 there, that's where we are starting to hide information. Go to the next level, hiding more, hiding more, hiding more. Now we can go back and start adding it back. You can see here, now we just have like about four layers, um, which is a lot easier to understand. And if we start understanding what it is and we need more detail, we can just increase the tail again, and every time we increase or decrease detail, it reformats so it still stays kind of um, kind of consolidated and nice looking. Let's increase it a little bit more. 
Okay, so you can see how that worked. Let's go back to our presentation. All right, in conclusion, we saw how we could solve a real problem for C++ programmers by combining several Emacs features. Overlays, compilation mode extensions, and balanced expression navigation using syntax tables. Emacs is often compared unfavorably to newer IDEs and editors with slicker user interfaces. But what Emacs has that they don't is powerful abstractions, tons of libraries, and decades of work by some of the luminaries in the field of software. I think that this project would have been much harder to do in a prettier but less powerful environment. In short, there's plenty of hope for Emacs. Thank you.